right now. So Robert, I missed it. Um, seven and a half minutes to plead your case before a hostile court with judges who are arguably but not arguably engaged in constitutional violative behavior by locking people up um, uh, with the with the two uh, veterinary that was the, the guys practicing veterinary medicine but were not um, you know dealing with pregnant cows in Pennsylvania. You have seven and a half minutes to argue your case. I missed it. I heard the the Bourbon with Barnes recap, but how do you think it went? And um, when do you expect an answer? And for those who may not be familiar with what's going on with Amos Miller, that's very few people. Tell us how it went. Yeah, so Amos Miller is a, a fifth generation Amish farmer from Lancaster County. Uh, the county portrayed in films like Witness, uh, an extraordinary uh, dairy farmer, and he has all kinds of food. Uh, you can get, you know, the uh, you can get little pumpkin pies. You can get uh, great. These muffins are amazing. They just sort of fall apart. Uh, the cookies are like perfectly soft. You can get all his milk products. Uh, he's got a wide range of other products, but he's one of the most popular Amish farmers anywhere in the world uh, because of the quality of his food. He's been very dedicated to every organic method that's out there, avoiding chemicals that are uh, that are not desired by people that have experienced it. You know, trying to keep food as close to the way we did it at our founding generation as possible. Uh, and the result has been that uh, he has distributed tens of millions of food products to tens of thousands of Americans over more than a quarter, a quarter century. And in that time frame, as the government's own witnesses admitted at hearings and trials, uh, not, not a one customer, not one customer has ever complained to anybody anywhere at any time about any aspect of Amos Miller's food. Nobody has complained about its quality, about its safety, about the accuracy of its advertising. No aspect of it has anybody ever complained to any government agency at any time in any way. Instead, everybody who's ever experienced his food that had an opportunity to testify, testified on his behalf and said how his food was often critical, essential, and necessary for their medical benefits of they or their friends or their family or their loved ones, uh, or part of something important or significant to them personally or religiously. It's just the highest quality food you can get. Amos Miller, organicfarm.com. You can try it out for yourself. That has not stopped the government from constant, continuous harassment. And you might ask, why is it that they're harassing a guy who's never had a food recall in his life? Why is it they're asking a guy with the best safety record of any farmer in the country why are they trying to put him down? Why are they trying to suppress him? Why are they trying to prohibit ordinary people from choosing for themselves what food they put into their own bodies? Well, that's a question that kind of answers itself. Because in a world of corporatized, industrialized, mechanized, and increasingly monopolized food supply that is so contaminated, we have a chronic health epidemic in the United States uh, with food that has Lord knows what's in it. Uh, it's the kind of food that could survive a nuclear attack. It'd be their, that McDonald's burger or Twinkie would probably still be looking the same 30 years from now. Uh, and uh, the those people don't want any mere, the mere example of an alternative, an alternative that's healthier and makes you feel better and that you like better, like Amos Miller's food products. And because he's Amish, uh, they thought he was an easy target. Uh, the Amish don't seek legal relief or remedy in court. They'll defend themselves, but they don't sue anybody. Uh, they don't seek publicity. In fact, their religious tradition is to not be photographed, to not be broadcasted. So they thought, we're going to make an example out of him that will intimidate everybody else, uh, and he won't be able to fight back. And ultimately, people on his behalf reached out to me and 1776 Law Center, where you can continue to follow all the details of the case. If you doubt anything I'm saying, you can go there and read the court transcript for yourself. And so the ultimately the trial court judge said that the state of Pennsylvania cannot prohibit people from outside the state of Pennsylvania from getting Amos Miller's food. That the permitting laws only apply to the Pennsylvania customer market. And that's it. And that's consistent with what the law says. That's consistent with the Constitution of the United States, which says that states govern food for their own customers, not for the entire world, because that would raise issues under the Interstate Commerce Clause, under the Dormant Commerce Clause, 
under the rights reserved to other states, the rights reserved to ordinary people under the 10th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the 1st, 4th, 5th Amendment issues implicated in food freedom. And and so the, the state was enraged and demanded uh, him, that uh, state court, trial court judge, uh, change his opinion four different times, and he refused. So then they went up to the Commonwealth Court, and the first thing they did is they asked for an emergency ruling shutting Amos Miller down. The judge who presided over that argument denied it, uh, and she was one of the three judges on the panel. Uh, the other two judges, one of them is an, uh, an older judge that's been there on, on the bench for a while, uh, originally ran as elected, their elected judges as a Republican, uh, but it uh, seemed more of an authoritarian bent. And that's the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, which was designed to be a court to check state power, has often become, uh, uh, they just write the checks for state power rather than be a check on state power. The third judge is the judge you mentioned. Uh, the third judge on the panel was the judge who illegally imprisoned to uh, farm workers who worked on Amish farms uh, with when the Commonwealth Court doesn't even have criminal power or jurisdiction, and the court didn't even have personal jurisdiction over either one of them. So you have a Commonwealth Court that has already twice tried to interfere in the 2024 election and was slapped down by no less than the liberal Democratic Pennsylvania State Supreme Court because of how they went so too far, now presiding over whether or not the state of Pennsylvania gets to shut down Amos Miller and try to bankrupt him before he ever gets to a trial on the merits of this case. Uh, we will see. Uh, the, uh, the, what was this? astounding were two things. One, that there was some confusion on the court as to whether this was a preliminary injunction or permanent injunction. When by definition, it can only be a preliminary injunction. There's been and, no discovery in this case. Well, There's and, been and no trial in this case. Stop there and just to flesh that out for people who may not know is that the, the, the criteria for obtaining a provisional or interlock well, provisional, if it's the same as it was in Quebec, you got provisional, interlocutory, permanent. And there's one element that's different on all three, where on the permanent injunction, you don't have to look at um, urgency or anything but the merits of the discussion. On a provisional, it's a little bit more stringent than an interlocutory, but you have to look at color of right. And it's at a stage where th the file itself is not is not completed and has not been fully threshed out, which is why the threshold to get an interlocutory provisional is higher than on the merits, which would be the permanent. I mean, how do they is how do they not know or how is there ambiguity as to what type of injunction was being sought here? There shouldn't have been. Uh, I mean, it's obvious. Uh, in other words, they requested a preliminary injunction. They received a preliminary injunction. There's been no discovery in the case. There's been no trial in the case. There's been not even time to fully brief the case. So, but at, at the trial court or the appellate court level, all of that's been rushed. That's the definition of preliminary, or as they say in Canada, provisional or interlocutory injunction. And the reason for it in the, so there's two different aspects unique to injunctions. For any injunction prior to a trial on the merits, the fear is what if the court gets it wrong? Because the court is guessing in advance of trial what's going to happen at trial. And what if the and what the the legal standard puts a heavy premium on restoring the status quo ante? Just let's not upset the status quo. Let's uh, not do something that if we're wrong, we can't undo it. And so you look at things like irreparable or irremedial injury. You look at public interest. You look at impact on third parties. Now, the reason the state was pretending that somehow this was no longer a preliminary injunction is because they've lost at every single stage on those other, what's called the four prongs, on those three other prongs. First prong is what's the likelihood you're going to win on the merits. That's the predictive prong. But the other three are, if we're wrong, who gets hurt? Who gets hurt in terms of the parties? Who gets hurt in terms of interested third parties? Who gets hurt in terms of the public? And the preference is to keep the status quo in that instance, the status quo before the lawsuit ever existed. Mm -hmm. And at the appellate level, it's to defer to the trial court. Say, we're not going to overturn the trial court if the trial court had any re Even if we disagree with the trial court, if it was reasonable what the trial court did, we're not going to interfere at this interlocutory stage. And that's what this is. This is an interlocutory appeal of a preliminary injunction which is supposed to have the highest burden known to man 
for the state to prove and meet. And one of the judges, the same judge who handled the emergency injunction, appeared very aware and cognizant of that. The other two judges, it was far less than clear they were cognizant. Uh, it's it's the most frustrating thing on earth where like it only impacts the the evidence that needs to be adduced before the judges. And they're somehow like, oh, let's, let's just skip to who's right and who's wrong and not the three other criteria, which are uh, typically weighed in favor of uh, the person to get, well, the well, person who satisfies those criteria. Extraordinary. Even though the local Link Lancaster press continued to report false information, as they engage in a defamation campaign against Amos Miller because they know Amos Miller is Amish, he doesn't sue. So they can defame and libel him without consequence. That's why they keep doing it. The, in fact, this whole case started by the state falsely alleging that Amos Miller's food product had caused somebody to get sick. It was all false. They've had 10 years of investigating him. They've lied about him for years in these other cases. Then when you investigate, you find out there's no grounds for it. We get to the hearing. Well, where are these witnesses that supposedly got sick from Amos Miller's food? Guess what? They're not there. And the judge says, like, where are these people? They did it. You had me sign an emergency injunction that shut them down for six weeks because you told me there were these people that were badly sick. Well, where are they? And the state was like, well, uh, they're not here yet. But we didn't actually find anything in the food supply that was consistent with the, uh, with the sickness. Oh, isn't that something? And it even turns out something they've been blaming him for six years ago. We get the actual final records for. This is why they want judgment without discovery, judgment without trial. And that they've been lying about him for years. And they knew they were lying about him for years. That it turned out the person had the sickness six months before they were ever around Amos Miller's food. This was someone, by the way, had like fourth uh, stage terminal cancer. And they blamed that person's uh, uh, later death on, on him. Had nothing to do with him. She never even ate them, drank anything related to him. And it turned out the underlying mysteria that they were trying to blame, she had six months prior when she was never around any kind of food of Amos Miller. And they knew this, and they hid it, and they lied about it. So when they got up, when the state's attorney got up at the Commonwealth Court, here at this sort of bookmark stage of the case, does he say any word, one word about food safety? No. Does he claim anybody would be hurt or injured if Amos Miller's food has continued to be distributed? No. The entire argument is one from power, disguised as one for safety. But now the, the mask is off. They don't care about safety. They didn't say one word about it at the oral argument. They just said, this is our power, and you better give it to us, or others will get out of line, judges. And the one judge, the uh, older judge in, in the middle of the panel, the who had been on the bench the longest, that's what I mean by older, the uh, she asked, oh, well, haven't people clearly gotten sick from Amos Miller's food? And it's like, please reread the briefs. Uh, no, no one's gotten sick. I was like, that's what's extraordinary. This guy has the best safety record. I'll put it up against any farmer in America. It definitely against any big industrialized food product. That's the reason why so many kids are sick today. And we have so many chronic diseases today. And we're bankrupting our governments with health care costs today. Uh, but to the profit of big pharma and big hospitals and big medicine and a lot of other folks. Uh, is because our food is such crap. These are There is no chronic disease epidemic in the Amish community. There is no record levels of anxiety and depression and stress in the Amish community. They're mm -hmm. living healthier, happier lives than they ever have before. And maybe it has a little something to do with the fact that they eat their own food the way our founding generation ate it. And imagine being in a place today where, I mean, like one of the people on our board put it well, because they were shocked by the nature of the state's arguments. Like they're saying our right to eat is actually a privilege that we don't even have a right to eat. We don't even have a right to decide what goes well, in our own body. What that I, that's a state privilege dependent on their permitting. What I've been trying to figure out the entire time is Pennsylvania is now no longer even saying you can't sell this within the state because it's illegal according to state law. They're saying you can't sell it outside of the state. And I'm trying to think of something analogous, like selling drugs outside of the state would well, be- Well, give an idea. As I explained, that, meant, that would make every truck driver transporting food across the state of Pennsylvania criminal. Not only that, two things. They also define the word sale to mean deliver, to mean exchange. So to give people an idea, if Amos Miller took food to the Amish wedding, it's Amish wedding season in, in November, 
to someone outside of his immediate family, then that's a crime, in, according to the state of Pennsylvania. You have to have a permit for that. Now, if, if you're a truck driver and you're transporting food or any part of the food supply across state lines in Pennsylvania, you're now a criminal unless there's a Pennsylvania permit for that food product. Even if you are bringing it from outside the state or transporting it outside the state. One of the defendants in this case is a West Virginia farmer who doesn't sell into Pennsylvania. But because Amos Miller has a legal interest in that farm, and they made this clear to state, they said not only does it apply if any part of the food supply ever crosses our lines, that's a illegal unless it has a Pennsylvania permit. If you are a Pennsylvania resident, it covers you anywhere in the world you ever go. If you're a Pennsylvania resident and you have a farm in France, you now have to have a Pennsylvania permit to sell the food in France. That's how insane this is. And the court is sit there and contemplating this because that's how out of touch the Commonwealth Court is. I mean, they failed their basic task to be a check on the government. This is a specialized court in the state created for the sole and whole purpose of controlling the administrative state, of disciplining the administrative state, of limiting the administrative state, of looking out for the individual. And instead, they have become a rubber stamp of the administrative state. They should be asking these questions. I shouldn't have to be making it clear to them the consequences, the insane consequences of this decision. Because I pointed out, no, they, the, the state couldn't find one court case anywhere in the history of the entire country where any court had issued an order like this that said, you, a farmer, cannot distribute your food or exchange your food without a state permit to anybody outside your own family. I mean, and by the way, there's a separate food destruction order where they're destroying food that says he can't even feed his own a family. He can't even feed his own can't feed himself, his own farm food, can't even feed his own pigs, according. That's how nuts this is. This is the biggest and most precarious power grab in the history of food politics in America. And we'll see if the Commonwealth Court has common sense or not, because it's clear what the statute is intended to be. The statute says this is all about protecting the Pennsylvania customers in the commercialized marketplace. Nothing in there talks about regulating farmers, regulating the food supply, regulating people bringing food. I mean, under this law, they make it illegal for you to have a potluck dinner at your local church. That's how insane the power grab is by the state of Pennsylvania. So we'll see if the court has common sense or not. If they don't, we'll take it up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, take it up to the U.S. Supreme Court because there's U.S. constitutional issues implicated. Uh, but if you never know with the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, unfortunately, the nature of the questions, one judge seemed on it, two of them seemed out of it. And so who knows what's going to happen? They seem like the one judge seemed shocked. So don't you admit uh, there was all these health problems? Like there's zero health problems. He is he has the best safety record of any farm in the state of Pennsylvania or in the country. They couldn't, they had 10 years to prove one single person out of the tens of thousands that have eaten his food have any complaint, and they couldn't find one. One. And yet you have a judge that's, you know, snoozing at the wheel, getting to decide the power of our freedoms in America. Uh, so it's why, the, you know, people running for state office in Pennsylvania should be talking about this issue. And the Pennsylvania state legislature should be improving on this issue. Uh, the, there's probably going to be a shock come election day in Pennsylvania for the institutions in power there as to who is going to win on election day. Part of it is because of what they're doing to people like Amos Milton. But if you want to figure it out for yourself how good his food is before the government tries to prohibit you from even getting it, AmosMillerOrganicFarm.com.